Welcome to the public worship of Walla Walla Presbyterian Church for Sunday, May 24th. My name is Albert Yellen. I'm pastor here at Walla Walla Presbyterian Church and welcome um, to my study where we are filming this week's sermon. We're glad that you have chosen to make our worship service part of your spiritual journey. So wherever you're at on that journey, whether you are a seeker looking for Christ, whether you're a believer who, who needs to be edified and built up, or whether you're a disciple that needs to be deployed into mission and ministry, we're glad that you have joined us. A couple of things I want to make sure folks know. Um, first of all, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and we have a special drive-by event planned here at the church. We invite everybody to come to the church um, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and when you arrive, you'll receive a small gift as well as a devotional um, that will lead you through a week of devotions on the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Pentecost. Also, I want to pause right now and um, take a moment to recognize and thank all the veterans among us. As this is Memorial Day weekend, we have an opportunity to give thanks. To give thanks for all of those brave men and women who have given the ultimate gift that we might have freedoms and we might have our liberty. And so let's take a moment and watch this video as we use it as a way of giving thanks and remembering those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God, lift the hearts of those who see tomorrow not as a joyous celebration, but a painful reminder of sorrow and loss. Give strength to those who have lost family. Comfort those whose loved ones have died serving their country. Serving our country. With thankful hearts, let us remember their sacrifice. Let us cherish, nurture, and handle with care, even now, the freedom for which they fought and died. Amen. Good morning. I'm Jim Wilson. Please join me in the call to worship. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death.
little else I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need you. join me in the confession. While we claim to celebrate the ascension of our Lord, the way we live proclaims our lack of faith in his power to deal with the world. Let us confess the incongruity between our faith and practice. Let us pray. We come, O Lord, on this day of glory to confess our lack of trust. While we sing of your lordship over all creation, we have too often acted as though you are powerless in the face of today's events. Help us to live with confidence in your presence today and in hope for life with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me for a moment of personal reflection and confession. Our assurance of pardon comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, 
the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Turn the hearts of the kings. Turn the hearts of the kings, Lord, that hold responsibility in their hands. Turn their hearts to you, that they would do right by you and by the people they serve.
on an online worship service, it feels a little bit odd to have a call for the offering in an offertory, but we have kept it in our worship because we believe offering ourselves to God, whether it be our time, our talent, or our treasure, remains a significant part of being a follower of Christ, whether we are joining together in person in a sanctuary or whether we're watching um, in our homes, whether you maybe have found us on a Thursday afternoon at work when you were um, taking a break from something else. Whenever it is you found this video, being a faithful disciple, contributing to God's kingdom, remains a significant discipline in the life of a Christian. And we here at Walla Walla Presbyterian Church, we place our, our offering, our call for it, our invitation, and our opportunity to think about it after we've done a prayer of confession and received the pardon. And that's for a specific reason. You see, our offering is always in response to God's goodness. It's in response to God's grace. We don't give an offering and then ask for God's forgiveness. We give an offering because we've been reminded of our forgiveness. It's the outpouring of a thankful, grateful, generous heart. So even in these strange times, as we consider what it means to contribute to the work of Christ and his kingdom in the world, I invite each of us to take a moment and think, what will we offer today in our time, in our talent, or our, our treasure? We continue in our study of the book of Acts that actually we've been in for about a year and a half now. And particularly for the last um, several weeks, we've been in a particular part of the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He has been with the Gentile churches and he's gone around collecting an offering for the church that's in Jerusalem. And so he's been in Macedonia and he's been in modern day Greece. He's been in modern day Turkey, Asia, Minor, and he's been gathering from all of these Gentile churches, a very generous offering. And each place he goes and he um, is overwhelmed by the generosity of the Gentiles, the followers of Christ in each place keep receiving a vision from the Holy Spirit that Paul is headed into danger. When he goes to Jerusalem, there's going to be tough times for him. He's going to be taken into bondage. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be persecuted. And in place after place, it is interpreted as the Spirit saying, don't go. But Paul consistently receives another message, that while there is danger ahead for you in Jerusalem, you are called to go there. You're called to take the offering. You're called to face that which is going to happen to you there. And so as we've been traveling along all these different places, it's been um, kind of a uh, repeat, um, same message um, from a different person. Well, in many ways, it ramps up today when there's a particular prophet who gets very theatrical, if you will, about demonstrating what's going to happen to Paul. And it all crescendos when Paul has to confront those who would tell him not to go, and yet he knows and he is compelled to go. So this morning, let's um, prepare our hearts and minds to re receive God's word to us as we have an opportunity to listen to Jim read the text for us this morning as he's going to be reading out of Acts chapter 21. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 21 verses 8 through 14. The next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But he said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we could not persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. 
the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jim. Let's have a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, take this word and activate it and activate its meaning in our lives by your Holy Spirit. And, O Lord, I ask that you would take my words and that you would embed yourself in them so that they would become your word for your people this day whenever they hear it or come across it. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us minds that are open, hearts that are pliable, and wills that can be molded for your purpose in this world, for the building of your kingdom and the blessing of your people to your glory alone. Lord, all these things we pray in the name of Christ, even as we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4 says this, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is is seated at the right hand of God set your minds on the things that are above not on the things that are on the earth for you have died and your life is hidden in Christ with God when Christ who is your life is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory the summary of this statement is you have died with Christ you have ascended with Christ and your life is hidden in Christ. What a profound statement. And those who really believe it, as the Apostle Paul did, live differently because of it. This statement from Colossians talks about our death as a past tense, as well as our ascension or our resurrection into the heavenly places as a past tense. Then the Greek tense changes and says, your life is hidden in Christ. What does that mean to be in Christ? A couple of years ago, I preached a sermon series called The Gospel in Prepositions. It was organized by one of my favorite little books, um, Life in Christ by John Stott. He goes through his chapters with titles like this, Through Christ, With Christ, under Christ, for Christ. But his third chapter is entitled, In Christ. That expands the same idea I began with when I quoted Paul by saying that his life is hidden in Christ. Early in the chapter, Stoss writes this, Let me clarify immediately that our third preposition, in, when used in relation to Christ, is not spatially. To be in Christ does not mean to be inside of Christ, as the family are in the house when they spend an evening together, or as clothes are kept in a wardrobe, or tools in a box. No, to be in Christ is not to be located inside Him or to be locked up in Him for safety but rather to be united in Him in a very close relationship. Jesus Himself puts this beyond any dispute by His own allegory. I am the vine and you are the branches. If anyone remain in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15 verses 4 and 5. It is evident from this metaphor that to be and to remain in Christ was to enjoy a living and growing relationship with Him. As we read about the Paul and his final stop before he arrives in Jerusalem, we see a man confident in the fact that he is in Christ. Because he is at all moments in Christ, he's understands that there is nothing the world can do to him that doesn't work out ultimately for God's glory. That all things work together for good, Paul would write in one of his letters. He is confident, even if chains and difficulty lie ahead for him, he will what? Remain 
in Christ, in relationship, in intimacy with his Lord Jesus. And for Paul to be in Christ means to be in the heavenly places where Christ is. That is the reality for all in Christ. Not just Paul, but for all of us. As we have seen for the past couple of weeks and again today, Paul is ending his third missionary journey as he is compelled to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost so that he can celebrate the Pentecost feast with the believers there and give to them the generous gift from the Gentile churches. This large gift that he has to share with them. And he wants them to receive it by Pentecost. As he moves closer and closer to Jerusalem, the believers and followers of Jesus keep telling him that the Spirit is warning them that danger lies ahead for Paul. Yet with every warning, he continues his journey. He gets one leg closer, one city closer, one ship ride closer. Today's text has the most graphic of the warnings. A prophet named Agabus was used, uses a belt to demonstrate what the Spirit has revealed concerning Paul's destiny. It is indeed fortuitous that next week we as a church will celebrate Pentecost. And in the text of Acts, we will see Paul in Jerusalem when? For Pentecost. He gets there in time for the feast. Today's text, while a day before he arrives in Jerusalem, falls on the day of ascension on the church calendar. The scriptures tells us that Jesus ascended into heaven on the 40th day, meaning 40 days after the resurrection, or about 43 days after Passover, or about seven days before Pentecost. So the Sunday just before the Sunday of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all the believers who had gathered in Jerusalem, the ascension of the Lord took place. And so it's always on the Sunday before the Sunday of Pentecost that the church remembers the ascension of Lord Jesus. His ascension is a biblical and historical event. But frankly, many in the church today have neglected to think about, study, and to realize the implication of the ascension of Lord Jesus. Yet I would argue it's essential to Paul's understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And the reason why this repeated warning, what lies ahead, he, he, in spite of them, he still moves forward ever onward to Jerusalem and has announced arrest. Now this morning, I'm not going to try to undo years of neglect of this topic on the ascension in one sermon, but I do want to touch on the meaning and the importance of the ascension of the Lord Jesus because embedded in it, the secret to Paul's understanding to his identity in Christ can be found. Let me remind us of the summary of Colossians that we started this message with. You have died with Christ. You have ascended with Christ. And your life is hidden in Christ in the heavenly places. Paul understands that he is in Christ because he has already participated in his death, resurrection, and ascension. A pastor, author, and friend of mine, Reverend Scott Dawson, is one of the leading contemporary writers on the ascension and why it's important and why it matters for modern day Christians. He is the pastor at the First Presbyterian Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And several years ago, I had the honor of preaching in that pulpit. He has written a book, Jesus Ascended, The Continuing Meaning of Christ's Continuing Incarnation. You see, the incarnation of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus and his continuing incarnation are inextricably linked together. The ascension is the ultimate mic drop and pronouncement that Jesus has left the building. What a dramatic event. In the ascension of Jesus, we are told that Jesus goes up into heaven. But what does go up mean? At one point in the earth's rotation, going up means towards Polaris. 
At another point in the Earth's rotation, it means going up towards Jupiter. At another point in our rotation, it might mean going up towards the planet Plebis. Further, we are told that Jesus went up into the clouds. The space program has discovered many things. But one of the things it has not discovered, and will never discover, is the location of heaven. That is because heaven is a dimensional location. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not denying the physical resurrection. To the contrary, his ascension demands a physical heaven. I also, with the scriptures, expect a physical return of Jesus. He will come again just as he left, the disciples were told. I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus remains physical. The ascension tells us that the incarnation is what? Not over. But the incarnation is continuing. And it now continues in heaven. The incarnation was not a momentary event, but an eternal expression of the Father's love in the sending of the Son. As John Knox has said, Jesus is in heaven in his self-same body. The body that was born in a major, walked on earth, and was crucified, is the same body that was resurrected, it's the same body that appeared to the apostles, and it's the same body that ascended, and it's the same body that now sits at the right hand of God the Father. John Calvin said, do we place Christ in a cottage among the stars? We, ha we know he has gone to a different, what? Realm and reality. A different dimension, as Einstein might describe it. C.S. Lewis said that by ascending upward, it evoked different thoughts in us. If Jesus had descended into heaven, something he surely could have done, we would not have been able to comprehend in his ascension, we understand his glorification and the fulfilling and living into his office as what? Jesus, the King. Christ, the Lord. In Greek, Christos, ho kurios, the summary of the incarnation and earthly ministry of Jesus. In his book, The Last Battle, Lewis describes the experience of heaven as going further up and further in to be with the king. The king of glory spoken of in Psalm 24.10, sung about in the Messiah, is the one written about in Philippians chapter 2. The ascension is part of the lifting up of Jesus that he spoke about in John chapter 3 when he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up, referring to the cross before he can enter into his glory, referring to his ascension into heaven. And so we have this glorious image in Philippians 2, 9-11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name. And listen to this. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What beautiful stirring words. So Jesus ascends upward into the glory cloud. You see, over 30 times in the scripture, the glory of cloud is represented. The glory of God is represented in a cloud. It might be the cloud of Exodus. It could be the cloud of his transfiguration. The cloud always represents the heavenly realm intersecting with the earthly realm. We see up as towards God, as it gets down to the earth where we bury the dead. The living rise, the dead fall. And so for our understanding, Jesus ascends upward into the cloud of glory where earth and heaven meet. When asked why the ascension, I say, it assures us the incarnation continues. Christ just didn't come down to earth slumming it with us, as it were. 
Dawson says, Jesus didn't say, I'm glad all that incarnation stuff is over. I can now unzip this physical suit and be done with it. No, the incarnated Christ ascended and his incarnation continues today. He went to heaven as a pledge to all that we will be with him. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. The ascension tells us Christ has not let go of our humanity. He truly wants to take us where? Into the very presence of God. In Christ Jesus, man enters the presence of God. Humanity enters the presence of God. And so what? All who are in Him, all who are a part of Him, all who are connected with Him as He is the vine and we are the branches, all who are in Him will be where? With Christ in His glory, in the presence of God. That's why it's so critical that the incarnated Christ ascends into heaven because it opens up heaven For the early church, the ascension was taken much more seriously. The Apostle Creed has 12 verbs about Jesus. The first nine verbs in the Apostle's Creed are past tense. Listen, who was conceived? Who was born? Who suffered? Who was crucified? The ascension is the last past tense. When we say in the creed, he ascended into heaven. The ascension is the last part that takes place in this world. Then it moves to what Christ is doing now. Christ is not inactive. To the contrary, Christ and his ministry continues. He sits at the right hand of God. The ascension is the hinge from which he has done to what he is doing now. The incarnation continues in heaven and his presence is now fully and completely by his spirit left with us. So we have a presence with Christ in and through and by the dwelling of his Holy Spirit that was given on that Pentecost day so that we continue in the presence of Christ who is where? In heaven. Torrance has this to say about the ascension and its relationship to the earthly ministry of Jesus. By withdrawing himself from our sight, Christ sends us back to the historical Jesus, Christ, as the covenanted place on earth and in time which God has appointed for meeting between man and himself. The ascension means that our relation to the Savior is only possible through the historical Jesus. The Jesus whom we meet and hear to the witness of the Gospels. Further, we are told that the ascension brought joy to the disciples. That seems almost counterintuitive. Jesus was leaving them. Why would the fact that Jesus was leaving them bring them joy? Their joy was derived from the presence of God's glory. They couldn't help but have joy with the presence of God all about them. Saying he ascended into the clouds means he ascended into the Shekinah glory of God, represented by the clouds. Jesus promises us that what we will what join him there. The joy is produced by seeing their Lord glorified knowing the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit and anticipating their union with Him in His glory in the heavenly places. Why? Because He has gone there to prepare a place for us, just as He promised in the Gospel of John to the disciples in the upper room. In my Father's house there are many places. If it were not so, would I tell you that I go there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am there you may be also. You see, the physical ascension of Jesus is critically important because it tells us that we will be in the presence of God. And we have been redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. 
No wonder they have joy. No wonder Paul could face what would take place in Jerusalem. No, ma- no wonder we can face up to whatever has happened in our life and greet with joy whatever will happen in our life. Christ has ascended. He is in glory. He intercedes for us and he reigns for us and he will return for us. Thanks be to God. With this appreciation for the ascension, let us look a little bit more closely in our final moments today at today's text. Don't you wish, Paul, friends, that Caesarea had begun where they ended? Only after pleading and begging with Paul and breaking his heart that they were fighting the Spirit rather than giving him encouragement with their insistence that he not go to Jerusalem. All the company there were urging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Notice in verse 12. It says we. And so Luke, who had heard Paul in Macedonia and in Ephesus and Tyre, all along the way, the journey to declare his call to go to Jerusalem. It was only after Paul would not be persuaded that they say with resignation, the will of the Lord be done. Oh, that they had started at that place. Rather than having to get there through breaking Paul's heart. Might we learn more quickly to begin at the place rather than ending there by resignation? We keep wanting to tell God and others what is best rather than simply seeking His glory, His will, His purposes for our life. Even though we pray it in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even though we say we invite His will into our life. Even as we say we invite His kingdom values into our life. Even as we say, we will do social justice, we will do acts of mercy, we will proclaim and do evangelism in your name. How often do we want to be in control rather than to allow his will to be done? After a short journey from Tyre by way of Ptolemus, Paul stopped for a visit at the home of Philip in Caesarea. Philip, we have heard much about as we have gone through our study of the book of Acts. Earlier we met up with him several places, and today as Paul greets Philip in the church in Caesarea, it's as if we are meeting an old friend. He was one of the deacons elected by the church that we studied in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, who had been sent down to Samaria to preach the gospel, as we saw it in Acts chapter 8. Verses 4 through 24. And he introduced the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ, as we read in Acts chapter 8, 26 through 39. In Acts 8, 40, we are told that he went to Caesarea. He settled there and continued the ministry of a pastor and of an evangelist. His four daughters had the gift of prophecy, and we heard the dramatic presentation of the spirit revelation that took place. The difficulty for Paul was that he had to process the information about what the Jews would do to him and at the same time deal with his grief-stricken friends who wanted to keep him out of danger. It's not easy to fly in the face of a host of friends, all of whom believe your decision or direction is wrong, all who believe that the Spirit is telling them you're going in the wrong direction, you're taking the wrong decision, you're making the wrong moves. They had all prayed their prayers and Paul stood alone in the guidance he revealed and received. How can we account for these counter convictions? The Spirit had not given different guidance. Paul and his friends did what? Interpreted the same guidance differently. Paul added the resoluteness of previous clarity. His friends added the reserve of tender affection for their friend, for this dear apostle. Through Luke's eyes, we are given an inside look at the warm and caring relationship between Paul and his friends and the other believers. They really cared about the apostle. He was not only the spiritual and intellectual giant that we meet on the pages of Acts and in the many epistles that he had written, he was also a man capable of receiving and giving deep affection. 
Christ in him had softened his rigid, cold Pharisee's heart and made him able to share in profound friendships in the family of faith. We hear it in this verse 13. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Paul's heart was broken because this shepherd, this man who had a shepherd's heart, this one who would leave the 99 and seek the one as he had been instructed by Jesus, was having his heart broken because those with whom he was beloved were giving him instructions counter to the Spirit. When Paul had regained his emotional equilibrium, he went on to explain why his friends should not persist further in crushing his spirit. Listen to these words. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. This man who had already been in prison previously did not fear anything. Why? Because he knew he was in Christ. And where is Christ? He is in the heavenly places where he is seated as the king at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for Paul, even as he intercedes for us in our moments and our years. Paul did not fear death if it would glorify his master. He was so sure that the Lord that he did, he was so sure of the Lord that he did not fear rejection by man. He did not fear persecution. He didn't even fear death. Why? Because death had been conquered in the resurrection. He knew he was what? Alive forever. The Lord Jesus had ascended. That means heaven awaits for all who are, as thought reminds us, in him. It was after this persuasive speech that his friends ended where they should have begun. Only after this courageous statement were Paul's friends able to say what they should have said all along. Verse 14 is very telling. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. The same strength and courage God called for in Joshua as he led the Israelites into the land is the same strength and courage he gave Paul to be resolute as he headed towards Jerusalem. To stand firm in the face of objection. To stand firm in the face of persecution. These can be very difficult things, but Paul knew he could do it. Why? Because he was in Christ. The Spirit dwelt in him. And he was a citizen of another realm. While it's easy to be critical of Paul's companions, we have to look in a mirror and ask, what would we have done? We ha would we have said, go to your imprisonment, Paul? Go forward to your arrest and persecution? Would we have had the spiritual strength and courage to say, Paul, I'm with you. Paul, I trust you. Or would we have tried to hold on? just as they did. You see, it takes an understanding of the penetrating and present reality of the ascension and of the ascended Jesus to have the same kind of faith as Martin Luther wrote and we often sing, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. And his kingdom is forever because he has ascended to the heavenly places where his kingdom is. And so Paul could face anything on earth. And so can we. So we, like Paul, must move forward into what God calls us to do. Knowing Christ has ascended into the heavenly places and we will be with him there because we are by the blood of the Lamb in Him. Thy will be done. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
as we think about and pray for the world today, I'd invite you to um, do with me a, an exercise, a practice. Often as I begin a prayer, I begin with some silence and, and even a deep in-breathing. And I ask that to be a time where I invite the Holy Spirit to direct my prayer, to direct my thoughts, that I would be in union with the one who has ascended and is interceding on my behalf, on your behalf, on the world's behalf on behalf of this glorious church. So as we begin today, I'm going to take a, a deep breath. I invite you to do the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your incarnation continues and we are in awe. We are in awe of the strength and the purpose that you have given to your church and to your people. How can we help today but think about the martyrs of the church, those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for your kingdom and your glory, those who were treated unjustly, and yet they did it for your sake and for your name and for your glory. Oh Lord, might we have the courage of not only our conviction, but their conviction. The conviction we see writ large throughout your scriptures. We pray for your church wherever it is found in the world today. Whether it's found in places of ease or whether it's found in places of persecution. Whether it's growing or whether it's struggling to hang on. O oh Lord, might your church be empowered by your spirit to engage the evil of our world and of this world. Lord, might we do acts of justice. Might we perform acts of kindness. Might we live in such a way that we live counter to the cultural norms because we are living in sync with your norms of your kingdom of whom Christ is the head. Lord, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are challenged. We pray for those recovering from surgery, the old and the young. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are struggling with the COVID-19 disease, for those who are struggling from the results of our response to it, for those who are unemployed, for those who are seeing businesses evaporate, for those who are wondering, will a job be there? Lord, might each of us use whatever our experience is, whether it's an experience of continued blessing or whether it's an experience of, of difficulty and scarcity, might it always and every experience drive us to you. Drive us to you in thanksgiving. Drive us to you in our need and in our poverty. Drive us to you in our abundance and our riches. Lord, we want to be living out the reality of the ascended Christ and his continuing incarnational ministry. We want to live out the kingdom values expressed in the prayer of the kingdom, what we call the Lord's Prayer even as together we pray united in Christ and with one another and all believers in all times and places. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. On this Ascension Sunday, the Sunday before we celebrate Pentecost, might we celebrate the ascended Christ and his continuing ministry of the incarnational life. Might we live out his kingdom values 
might we always pause and at the beginning say, Thy will be done. And then do it. Just do it. And know that as we go, whatever peril or struggle or difficulty lies ahead, he goes with us. For even as he ascended, he promised, I will be with you always. Even to the end of the age. So go in that knowledge, go in that power, go in that strength. And now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Unto him who will present you without a single spot or blemish on that great day with rejoicing. Unto him who belongs our glory, honor, power, and dominion in his church now and forevermore. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be, remain, and abide with us now, now and forever. Amen. And amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Father, Son, and